Welcome to episode nine of Life with God. We're in season one, studying the love of God and the concept of love in the Bible and um, as it is reflected in God and uh, looking at how we can incorporate that reflection of God in our individual lives, in our different uh, key relational contexts. Tonight, our uh, discussion is going to be about emotions. And uh, I know that is an intriguing topic. It's also very complex and very complicated. It has been for centuries. Um, not just emotions, but also the emotions as they are experienced by God, uh, the emotions as they experienced in the in the divinity. And, um, you know, I expanded my understanding of emotions greatly during my chaplaincy, my hospital chaplaincy um, residency. Uh, early on in my experience, our amazing supervisor asked the group, we were six uh, in the group going through the program together, and she asked us one question. Um, Can you list some emotions? And we, we went with, you know, we listed a few, uh, the basic ones, love, hate, anger, um, frustration, I don't know, a very, very basic ones. And then she pointed us to some resources that listed a number of emotions. And my mind just expanded in the moment, just seeing the list of emotions. Um, I was surprised to realize that there are so many there are so many aspects, there are so many emotions that we experience constantly. And so as human beings, we are rational and emotional beings, and we're constantly experiencing emotions and reason, right? There's an interplay there in how we function that has, um, unfortunately, over the course of time has been misunderstood, I think, and downplayed to some extent due to some, uh, some of the um, predominant um, cultural understandings, philosophical understandings over time. So uh, let me just read a few things here for you, just, just to give you a picture of, of what I'm talking about. Um, emotions, uh, depressed, glad, delighted, charmed, grateful, upset, sorrowful, frustrated, anxious, uncomfortable, unsure, bitter, um, agitated, damaged, wounded, Certain, prepared, successful, peaceful, inspired, healthy, vibrant, um, unique, secure, um, ambitious, powerful, loved, accepted, empowered, understood, appreciated, cherished, and so on and so forth. There are so many emotions that we experience constantly. And so I think it's very important to, uh, to have a conversation about this aspect. But tonight we're going to focus, focus especially on how God experiences emotions and, and particularly in relation to the topic of love, because that is what we're studying, right? We're studying the love of God and the concept of love. And so our guest this evening is Dr. John Peckham, who has uh, studied extensively the love of God. Has, uh, he has written a few books on the topic. He has expert expertise uh, in this area. And um, Dr. Peckham is professor of theology and Christian philosophy at Andrews Theological Seminary. And I'm absolutely delighted that we can have this conversation with him. I'm so thankful, John, for giving us an hour of your time. So thank you. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation and being here. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Also part of the discussion, of course, we have a few students. And so I'm glad to welcome back Kian, Hobby, Nicola, and Ruth. Great to see you all. And I really look forward to, to your comments and questions as always. Um, we are studying who God is. This is a question that we're addressing in the program Life with God. Who is God? And we study who God is by raising different uh, questions related to different topics. In this particular season, studying the love of God. And so it is important for us to know uh, when we invite guests into the program who will speak to us about who God is, we also want to get to know a little bit about who they are, right? So John, to that end, we do have some questions for you, uh, and we'd like to get to know you some in just about five minutes, which are, I'm going to time with, with this hourglass here. Okay. When you go to a potluck, what is the dish you're looking for? Oh, special K roast. Well, what is your best personal talent? My best personal talent. Boy, I don't know. I don't know what my best personal talent is. I used to play basketball a lot, but those days are behind me now. So the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. <laughs> besides the Bible, what's your favorite book? My favorite book beside the Bible is, is The Desire of Ages. Uh, what is your favorite thing about your career? 
My favorite thing, oh, there's so many things. I mean, I love, love teaching at the seminary. I love encountering uh, wonderful students who have been called by God and want to come to know him better and help others to come to know him better. So that's one of many wonderful things about what I get to do for a living. Do you consider yourself an introvert or an extrovert? I'm, I'm definitely an introvert. Oh, I play what? an extrovert when I'm teaching, but I'm an introvert at heart. <laughs> what was an influential factor in your decision to get baptized? Oh, there were so many factors. When I, uh, when I was a child, my father was a youth pastor uh, in a college town at what, what was then Atlantic Union College. Uh, so I grew up around ministry, around youth ministry, and I was baptized when I was, I think it was 1992 when I was 11 years old. And one of the biggest factors was actually, um, to make a long story short, uh, was that I was encouraged by my father to read The Desire of Ages at quite a young age. And I, I did read that, and it's really, really shaped me in many ways throughout my life. How would you define prayer? Prayer? Well, a simple definition would be talking to God. If we're talking about, say, petitionary prayer, then that's uh, asking God to do things in the world, in our lives, or in the lives of others. So what's the best time of the day, in your opinion? The best time of the day is oh. when I have time to spend with my family, my son or my wife, whatever time that is, which is usually the evening. <laughs> oh, who would you say knows you the best? My wife definitely knows me the best. Brenda knows me the best. What is a favorite activity with your child? Favorite activity. We love playing all kinds of sports together, uh, throwing the baseball, uh, throwing the football, playing basketball outside when the weather allows, which isn't as often as we'd like here in Berrien Springs, but we, we do it whenever we can. What is your most favorite holiday? My favorite holiday, I think, would be Christmas. I love Christmas time, and especially now that my son is young, nine years old, and he's just the last couple of years, he's really gotten into it more and enjoyed it. And it's, it's lovely to see. And, and he actually uh, captures the spirit of Christmas. It's better to give than to receive. And so, uh, because mm -hmm. of course, Christmas is a time when we receive the greatest gift from Jesus. So. Something new you learned recently. Something new that I learned recently. Let me think about that for a minute. Um, I'm going to have to take a pass on that one at the moment because right now I'm working on working on some introductory materials of, of textbook textbooks. Fair enough. Fair enough. So tell me one thing in your opinion that everyone should start doing. Everyone, I think, I don't know if they should start doing it if they're not doing it already. Uh, but I think that in these times more than ever, I think we need to set aside dedicated time uh, for the reading and the studying of the word of God. I think that uh, Christians are called to be a people of the book, but I think that we're losing uh, some of that uh, biblical literacy. And a lot of that is not just in studying, there's a time and a place for deep study, and I certainly encourage that, but also broad reading of just dedicated time with God of, of reading the Bible. Hmm. Who is your hero? My hero, uh, other, other than Jesus, uh, my hero is my wife, Brenda, uh, especially during this pandemic. So we're homeschooling I, Joel for the first time for a number of reasons and, and uh, definitely right now. If you have a day for yourself to spend alone, where would you spend it? Uh, was it a day you said to spend alone? Yeah, to spend alone. Where would you set, spend it? Oh, one of my favorite places in the world is Sedona, Arizona, just hiking in the Red Rocks. So that's the first place that comes to mind. Okay. All right. Our time is up. Um, thank you so much, John. I, we appreciate learning a few things about you. And I'm sure that our viewers uh, will also appreciate knowing you a little better before we start the discussion. And um, so uh, a big welcome to our guests, uh, to our viewers as well. We are streaming on YouTube. And you're welcome to insert your comments and your questions in the chat box. We will monitor those. And as usual, we'd love to bring them into the discussion. And uh, we also have a link on Facebook to the YouTube stream. And so you're welcome to also comment on the Facebook link. And we will also um, check that and make room for you in the discussion. So don't feel shy. 
we, we do like to, in, to include other people. Um, and so if you have questions along the way as we discuss this interesting, rich topic, uh, please communicate with us. Um, John, there is, there is so much to talk about and we only have an hour. And so I, I'm curious on what aspects we'll get to uncover in this discussion. Uh, but uh, without any, any more comments, let's get started. Um, and, and my opening question is pretty broad. And so how did, how did Christian thinkers think about uh, or understood God's emotions? And how do you understand the Bible to speak about God's emotions in relation to the concept of love? Yeah, the, the question of divine emotions, whether God has emotions or not, is quite a contested one in Christian theology and philosophy. And uh, the history of Christian theology on this topic uh, what that says will depend on who you ask. So one very common interpretation of the history of the Christian tradition on this topic claims that the dominant view is that God has no emotions, at least no emotions if emotion is minimally defined as a kind of response to a stimulus, something that involves a change. And for our purposes here, we can just speak of it in terms of changing emotions. And there are uh, many historical theologians today who argue that the dominant stream in at least early Christian theology, going back to uh, very strong influences of some streams of Greek philosophy, is that God cannot experience any changing emotions. Uh, and th that's technically called impassibility, particularly what I call strict impassibility, because there are some others who interpret that tradition differently. And they say, well, it's true that very early in the Christian tradition, you have many theologians saying uh, that God, uh, they use this uh, Greek term apatheia, which is the negation of pathos and saying that God has no pathos. But there is a disagreement about whether those early theologians meant to, meant to say that God has no pathos whatsoever, or if they meant to say that God has no pathos of the kind that say the Greek gods had like no irrational emotions, or that he doesn't have pathos in the way that humans have that might be deficient in some ways. And so some Christian theologians say, oh no, they didn't mean to rule out divine emotions altogether. They meant to rule out particular kinds of divine emotions and particularly in, in dialogue with Greek thought that tended to think that emotionality was a weakness or at least particular kinds of emotions. Whereas another school of thought says, no, they, they intended to rule out divine emotions altogether and this is the consistent uh, view of what they call classical theism, what I refer to as strict classical theism, that God has no changing emotions because God cannot change in any way whatsoever. And there's a whole school of thought behind that philosophically that I won't go into now. I can go into it later if you wish. Uh, but the, the, the main views are the view that God has no emotions whatsoever, at least no changing emotions, that strict impassibility. And others say, no, uh, he has qualified impassibility. He has no emotions that affect him against his will, but he can will his own kind of perfect emotions. That's sometimes called qualified impassibility. And then there are other Christian theologians that say, to the extent that the Christian tradition claims God has no emotions, the tradition got it wrong because God certainly does have emotions. And there's really two kinds of views there as well. There are some that say God necessarily has emotions. He's necessarily related to some world. And there are others, that's what I would call an unqualified passability or essential passability. And others say, no, God is passable in a qualified sense, that he voluntarily creates the world. And by the world, I mean all of creation. And he voluntarily opens himself up to being affected by the world. And that's the view that I think is taught quite robustly throughout scripture. Scripture uh, very, very frequently depicts and portrays God as having strong emotions and emotions that change in reaction to human disposition and human actions. So over and over and over again, the Bible portrays a God who is deeply emotional. And he, he's, it's not that he's irrational ever. It's not that he's emotional in any kind of deficient way but he has emotions that are perfectly consistent with reason and an appropriate evaluation of the state of affairs at the time. 
So all throughout the Old Testament, I mean, we could quote page after page, but just a couple of examples. So in Isaiah 49, 15, God says this. He says, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but I will not forget you. And there, there's a, a contrast between the compassion that a mother has for her young child, which I'm not sure we know of any compassion greater than that, right? And God says, even she might forget, but I will never forget you. And that word for compassion there is racham is the Hebrew word. And the word for womb is rechem. And most scholars agree that the, the word for compassion, which is the main word for compassion throughout the Old Testament, one of the primary terms for divine love is actually derived from the term for womb, like a, a mother's womb. And so God here is depicted as having what some have called a womb-like mother love. And yet it's exponentially greater than the compassion that a mother has for her young child. That's one example. You have elsewhere in Hosea 11, 8, where God himself is lamenting and grieving over his people who have turned against him, have rejected him repeatedly. In fact, if you just look through the Old Testament, you can read like Psalm 78, Nehemiah 9. You'll see what Old Testament scholars call this cycle of rebellion, where the people basically reject God repeatedly commit spiritual adultery with all these false gods and basically leave God as an unrequited lover, right? And so you have this, in many ways, really depict, depiction of a heartbroken God throughout Jeremiah and many other biblical books. Here in Hosea, you see this come to the fore as well. Of course, Hosea itself is, is Hosea, the prophet, is called uh, to marry an adulteress, which is an analogy of the way God is in relationship to his people that are basically committing spiritual adultery against him. In any case, Hosea 11, 8, God says of his people, how can I give you up, O Ephraim? How can I surrender you, O Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I treat you like Zeboim? And Adma and Zeboim were the two small cities uh, alongside Sodom and Gomorrah that were destroyed in that, in that destruction. He, said, he goes on to say, my heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. This is, of course, deeply emotional and visceral language. I don't know if you've ever had an emotional reaction where you just felt it in your stomach, right? It feels like your stomach is churning. This is the kind of imagery, the kind of idiom that's used to describe the depth of divine emotion. And in fact, the language that is used there of God's compassion being kindled, that language, uh, the verb kamar of being kindled is also used of compassion being kindled to refer to human emotions that are the, of the strongest kind that we know of. So one example is in 1 Kings 3, where you have the two women who came before King Solomon, both claiming that the baby was theirs. And if you know the story, you know that Solomon, this is one example of his wisdom, where he says, cut the baby in two. And the mother who was the real mother, of course, says, no, no, don't do that. And the text in 1 Kings 3 describes her as having this kind of emotional reaction. And so it's that kind of language that is used of God in relation to the depth of his compassion and his love for people. And there are examples upon examples upon examples of God being portrayed as having those kinds of deep emotional reactions. And pretty much everyone in the discussion in Christian theology agrees that the Bible portrays and depicts God as having those kinds of emotions, but not everyone agrees that he actually has those emotions. I have a question. So just from your explanation, for me, it sounds much better to have a God who have emotion. Like what are the reason that people want to have a God that has no, no emotion? What are some reason for that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that question. So some of it's rooted in the idea that at least uh, human emotions, as we know them are deficient and imperfect, right? So when humans get angry, we often get angry for the wrong reasons. Uh, we might overreact. We might be irrational. Uh, emotions, it might involve, there might be positive emotions, but you might have negative emotions. And so some people wanted to say that God is nothing like the pagan gods or the Greek gods who were really like uh, just superhumans. They were really powerful humans with all the deficiencies of humans, but a lot of power to do even worse things. And so what happens in some streams of Greek philosophy is they want to say God is like the opposite of that. He's nothing like that. He is actually the perfect being. And they thought that perfection involved the lack of change, including the lack of changing emotion. So they thought whatever the perfect being is like, 
The perfect being would, would always live in perfect bliss. That's sometimes called divine blessedness. And so if God was to experience, say, grief or anger, that would, they thought, be a deficiency. And therefore, God wouldn't be perfect, but God has to be the perfect being. So that can't be true. Or they, they made arguments, uh, play to another's, that the one, the ultimate perfect being, cannot change in any way whatsoever because they reasoned this way. They said, if something changes, it must change for the better or for the worse. And of course, if it changes for the better, that means it wasn't perfect before it changed. And if it changes for the worse, it's not perfect afterward. Now, I think that's just a wrongheaded argument because uh, as many philosophers recognize today, you can have something called a value neutral change. You could change in a way that doesn't necessarily make you better or worse, and you could be perfect before and perfect after. But there was this kind of idealization of absolute immutability, which means not to change, and also of reason, pure reason, that rules out any kind of emotions. So that's some of the reasons why at least some streams of classical theology in the classical Greek tradition wanted to say that God cannot have any changing emotions. But it's quite interesting that, that many theologians agree with your intuition and say, actually, I think a perfect being would actually have emotions like compassion, right? If God doesn't have compassion uh, or grieve, when I grieve, that seems to be a deficiency, right? It seems like the most loving being should be the most compassionate one. And here you have competing intuitions, which in my view actually just shows one of the problems methodologically was something called perfect being theology. That's not to say that that there's no usefulness in those kinds of thought exercises. But at the end of the day, when it comes to deciding what God is like, you're going to run into people who have different intuitions. And so on one side, you have people that say emotions are a deficiency, so God can't have them. And the other side says, actually, emotions are a positive thing. And one who doesn't have them is the one who's actually deficient and impoverished. And how do you decide whose intuitions are right? For, for my part, I don't really have a lot of confidence in my own intuitions. If you ask me, what do I think God should be like? Uh, I would be prone to create him in whatever image I think God should be like, but that doesn't mean it's, it's going to correspond to reality, right? And so that's why I try to go to the Bible and ask, what does the Bible teach about God? And then that informs what perfection is rather than, again, it's easier said than done, but the attempt is to not impose on scripture my conception of what God should be like or what I wish he was like, right? Either in my own image, uh, which is what many theologians have done, kind of a projected anthropology, or what many in the Greek classical tradition did, just the opposite, right? You take anything that's true of humans, and then you just negate it, right? And this is called the via negativa, the way of negation, uh, which is why many of the attributes they argued for were negative, like impassibility, immutability. They're denying things of God they think that he shouldn't have. A related, <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> one of you guys, go ahead. So, okay. Obviously, you know, I kind of agree with Kiyun and, you know, personally, my intuition is that it's better to have a God with emotions. But I also know that if I had been born, you know, a couple centuries back, a few centuries back, I probably would have intuitively thought it's better for God not to have emotions. That was the cultural milieu. That was the, the, the way that people were thinking. Uh, so I'm with you. Let's go to scripture. Let's see what it says. But then my question is this. Why do we take the verses that talk about God's emotion as being literal, but we take the verses that talk about God having body parts like his arm or his eyes or th you know, things like that? Why do we say that, oh, that's metaphorical, that's not literal? So aren't we, aren't we picking and choosing which one we want to be literal or is there something that we can pull out of scripture that says why we're doing that? Yeah, yeah, this is an excellent question. And so it, it's very important to get clear on this. And so what I would say kind of in broad strokes is that all language about God in scripture is analogical, right? Mm. And so analogical is a term that refers to something that is an analogy. Whenever you have an analogy, you have both a likeness and an unlikeness, right? That's what an analogy is. There's similarity and there's dissimilarity. And so the question comes in with regard to what is the extent of the similarity and what is the extent of the dissimilarity with regard to the analogy? Now, I don't claim to know when it comes to biblical depictions or biblical portrayals of God in what ways beyond the biblical language correspond or don't correspond to God. And so I want to try to allow scripture to provide the hermeneutical control, so to speak, to, yes. to tell me what depictions or portrayals or claims about God are being depicted in a way that is corresponding to God as he is, uh, but still analogically, or is being used as a metaphor. Now, when it comes to language of emotion and body language, 
all of those categories of language of God are using common Hebrew idiomatic language, right? Wow. And so you have Hebrew idioms that are being used to describe something else. So many uh, scholars who believe that God is impassable, has no emotions, or entirely immutable, they will say all of those divine emotional language are anthropomorphic. It's language of God in human form, or more, tech, more, more specifically, anthropopathic language of God as if he had human emotions from anthropos, human, and pathos, emotion, right? And they say, it's just language speaking of him as if he had those things. Now, the problem with applying that kind of hermeneutic too quickly is the question then is, well, what does that language mean then about God? Because if you say that it's just anthropopathic, you seem to have divested it of any meaning. Now, it's different from, say, body language is used about God, because the body language that's used about God in scripture is demonstrably idiomatic. And so I could show you text after text after text where you have the same idiom used of humans that is used of God that uses uh, Hebrew words that depict, that literally depict human anatomy or, or body parts. But in context, idiomatically, no reader of Hebrew would take those to refer literally to body parts, right? So let me give you an example. So uh, one very common idiomatic expression in the Bible is, uh, is finding favor in the eyes of someone. So mm -hmm. Noah found favor in the eyes of God, right? Yeah. So literally, if you take that literally, it would be you have hen, the, the word for favor or grace in God's eye, right? So let me see. Let me see if I can find it there and pick it out, right? It's right. demonstrably an idiom. And the same idiom is used of God and of humans because humans also look at one another and the same idiom is used. You have an arm, right? If I will uphold you with my right arm, that's an idiom of strength or power. This is used of God and of humans. And mm -hmm. it has no literal uh, correspondence to the body language. You could theoretically have somebody whose arms are amputated and they could still be referred to as a strong armed person because mm -hmm. there's no necessary referent to the literal body language. And awesome. only somebody who's not understanding the idiom would make that kind of category error and apply that kind of language as saying something. And so basically the question is in Hebrew, exegetically, grammatically, syntactically, what is this referring to? None of it should be taking, taken hyper literalistically. When the Bible describes God as having emotions, uh, even the language we read from Hosea 11, 8 of, of stomach churning, that's not describing him of, as having an actual stomach that's churning because of humans, that same exact language is used. And it's not actually talking about their heart or their love turning over, right? We're not, we're not saying it actually turned. That's an idiom that's based on physical terminology to describe an abstract con concept of emotions. And so once you understand that, that correspondence, there's actually not this slippery slope from affirming the language of divine emotions to the body language. There's much more to say about that, but that's the basic idea. So if I were to like boil that down, just to make sure that I'm crisp on it and, and everybody listening is crisp on it, the passages that are describing emotion, if they don't mean God has emotion, we can't say what they mean. Like it's just, they're meaningless phrases. The ones that talk about him having a strong right arm or favor in his eyes, if those are metaphorical, they still have meaning. That That's one thing that kind of helps distinguish them. Yes, they're all, idi yeah, and, 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 yeah. And another way of saying that is they're all idiomatic. And the question is to what does the idiom refer? Mm -hmm. When you say, when those who want to negate divine emotions, ne negate them and say they're anthropopathic, they actually have to negate the text. The text doesn't, doesn't convey anything anymore, at least that I can see, because right. it's demonstrably an idiom of some kind of emotion. Now, I would agree that it's not, it's not univocal. That is exactly the same as human emotions, because God is far greater. God is perfect. There's always some difference, and God's emotions never have the imperfections that ours have. Yeah. But the idiom itself has to convey something. And what does it convey? And in Hebrew, it conveys some kind of emotional reaction. And you have not just th those kinds of language of idioms. You have just other statements where God says, I felt this way. And then I felt that way. Or just, it just says God was grieved, right? Mm -hmm. You have this very strong language and it's just said repeatedly. And there's not a single text in scripture that says God is impassable or makes a claim that would negate divine emotion. Mm -hmm. And there is just an avalanche of texts that portray him as having uh, deep emotional reactions. I have a question. So um, to, in today's world, I know that there's a lot of um, maybe uncomfortableness uh, talking about God having what we see as negative emotions. So like, for example, wrath, anger, um, 
and disgust even. Um, so it is very popular today to emphasize God's love and his compassion, his forgiveness, but not to talk about his anger, which I think is equally as valid as his love. So my question for you is like, this is the same God then, the same God now. Where do we see God's negative emotions today? And like, how can we um, wrestle with that? And how can we explain that to people who maybe struggle with the idea that God would have negative emotions? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you for that question. And so God's anger or God's wrath, I think, is just the righteous response of love against evil. Mm -hmm. And this is the way it is depicted all throughout scripture. So God gets angry at evil because he is love. Mm -hmm. Why does evil anger him? Because evil always harms someone, even when it's just uh, self-harm. And every single person in the world is a child of God, at least in the broad sense. So every single instance of evil hurts someone God loves, and the righteous response against that harm against people is righteous indignation. Now, that's different than the kind of anger that we might sometimes experience that is an overreaction or irrational or self-serving or many other kinds of deficiencies. God's anger is always a proper evaluation of evil, and in fact, he actually holds back. So Psalm 78, 38 says he often restrained his anger. Why? Because of his mercy and his compassion. And it's very interesting that throughout scripture, the question that is often asked by the prophets and the people of God is almost the exact opposite that many people in the West ask today. Many people in the West, because I think sadly, sometimes they're only aware of some texts about divine anger and they don't really understand the context of those texts and how much time is passing between judgment events and what's going on and how long God actually is bearing along with the people. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, they misunderstand what's happening. And they say, why, why is God angry so much in scripture? Which again, actually, I think is a misunderstanding of what's happening there. Whereas in the Bible, the question is often asked is, how long, God, before you will bring judgment? Why? Mm -hmm. Because in the Bible, judgment is a good thing because it vindicates the oppressed from the oppression of the oppressors. It uh, brings deliverance to those who are living in a state of injustice. And the God of the Bible is a God who loves justice. In fact, one of the primary terms for God's love in the Old Testament, chesed, is inextricable from concern for justice and righteousness. So God's love and justice go together. And if you actually love someone, you're going to be concerned about injustice that is perpetrated against them. Now, again, human anger is often an overreaction, self-serving. God's is never like that. But God's anger is always a righteous indignation. And just one more thing really quickly Tied to that question, many people think, oh, the God of the Old Testament is a wrathful God, and the God of the New Testament is not. Well, the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are one and the same God. And if you want a very clear and straightforward depiction of who God is, just look at Jesus, right? Jesus is the one who came to reveal God as he is. So let's ask ourselves a question. Did Jesus ever get angry? Yes. Repeatedly in the gospels, he got angry. You might remember the story when the children came to him and people were trying to take them away. The text says he got angry. He said, let the, let the children come to me. Okay. You, the, probably the most well-known example is the example of the cleansing of the temple where Jesus overturns the tables in righteous indignation. Why was he on, so angry? It wasn't just because they were misusing God's house. It was because they were using the sacrificial system of the sanctuary to swindle and oppress people and take more money from them. This is what they were doing at the time. People would come with their sacrifices, right, in a way to become right with God. And some people there at the time, of course, the sacrifices had to be perfect, right, without blemish. And so all you have to do at the temple is if you find a blemish, then you can reject the sacrifice they bring. Then you have to buy a sacrifice from us at the temple. But wait, you can't use your regular money. You have to actually exchange your money. And if you've ever traveled, you know that there is, you know, an exchange rate. So there's a little bit of a, a markup. So you have to change your money with the money changers, and then you can buy the new sacrifice. Jesus was righteously indignant mm -hmm. at the fact that the temple, which was supposed to symbolize God himself, making the provision to make us right with God, was being turned on its head and being used as a way to take money from poor and oppressed people who were trying to come into right relationship with God and actually using it as a den of thieves, a den of robbers. And so he is rightly angry and he responds in the anger that is the anger of love against injustice and oppression. Hopefully that, that's making sense. 
there, there's much more than that throughout scripture. One thing I love with that story is God, you know, Jesus anger, you know, the anger of God is the kind of anger where kids feel comfortable coming to him right after his outburst of anger. And so like, for me, like a, a huge difference between God's anger and my anger, when I'm angry, little kids would run away from me. When God's angry, little kids feel safe. Yeah. 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 And God, and the anger of God in both the old Testament and the new Testament is, is, is most often directed at those who are self-righteous and in positions of power and abusing that power and abusing their status. And that should have known better. And people that today people tend to look down on, those were the people that did, were not usually objects of Jesus' anger uh, or God's anger in the Old Testament, the poor, the oppressed, the downtrodden, the outcast. Of course, these were the people that, uh, that Jesus was accused of spending too much time with. Uh, but there's a reason why he spent time with them, because this is who the God of the Bible is. The God of the Bible is the God of the oppressed. Hmm. Hmm. Um, so... I have something that I want to bring up, and it was something that I think correlates to what we're talking about. Uh, in Habakkuk, we see that the prophet is talking or bringing up the case to God, speaking to God in, in for Judah. Because if we see the storyline, and this is something that Rahel Wells um, in my class today mentioned, she said, if we see the storyline right, King Manasseh was a bad and evil king, and after him, his successor, Amen, wasn't that great either. I mean, two years in, and they, you know, he was killed by his servant, which goes to show what type of leadership he had. And then after that, we see Josiah, the eight-year-old boy who reigned for 31, about 31 years, and it was a good reign. Um, and in that space, in that moment, we have the, the people of Judah um, going back and following the ways of the Lord and rebuilding the temple and et cetera. But they also are voicing out complaints like, why aren't you doing anything, God? Um, because they are in captivity, right? Why aren't you, why aren't you moving? And sometimes I feel like that's exactly the question in the big problem of theodicy, right? If there is a God of love, why does it seem like this emotion of love seems so passive, to humanity why isn't actually doing anything and i think it's the same question that they were asking where are you it's kind of like the question we're asking today where where are you and this whole scheme and so i kind of want to touch on that because i only thought right joe would would suggest that but it goes to show how habakkuk suggests that too and on a quick note i want to add this um in habakkuk we have a beautiful picture of faith as well um, God is calling him and the people to continue in the faith of who he is. It actually specifically points that in chapter two, which is mind blowing, but not to get too in, in depth into that. I want to also ask the question, how can we continue to have faith understanding that change and doubt is so involved in that picture and it's okay? Because you mentioned something earlier. You said that the reason why they would mention that God um, is impassable, right? Why he, he, why his emotions wouldn't change is because they had this, this striving for perfection. And I don't think that intention was purely wrong. I actually, it sounds kind of good in the sense of like, man, they're wanting the best out of life. And they're thinking that if they don't actually deal with their emotions, then if God doesn't have emotions, then maybe they can, they can fix it. They can make it right. Like we all sense this struggle, right? Of sin. And we want to make things right on earth. So maybe we shouldn't deal with emotions, but, um, but we kind of have to, and we, in a way, by dealing with emotions, be okay with change and doubt and things not being perfect. Mm -hmm. So how do those two things coincide or co-align? Yeah. Yeah. There's so much there. And I could, I could speak on this for, for maybe, maybe days. This is a question that's near and dear to my heart. And actually the main reason why I became a theologian in the first place. And so anything that I say right now is going to be uh, hopelessly inadequate. So let me just say two things, recognizing the problem is, is so vast that we, we need to say a whole lot of things to try to even get at it. First of all, I want to say that there is a strong theme throughout the Bible in the book of Job and elsewhere that we are not in a position to know many things that we wish we could know, right? And so there are many things that God is doing and many things going on behind the scenes of which we are not aware. So in the case of Job, there is this whole scene going on in heaven in what's sometimes called the heavenly council, where Satan is there and there's something going on. And Job, at least as far as we can see in the narrative, doesn't know anything about it. And at the end, he comes to realize he's not really in a position, in a position to know. But the fact that Job doesn't know why God is doing, or from his perspective, not doing what he thinks he should be doing, the fact that Job doesn't know what the answer is, 
it doesn't follow from that, that there isn't a good answer or that there isn't a good reason, right? And so there are many things we don't know. But beyond that, God is doing more than what we typically see. There are a number of facets here that are closely related to love. One of them is that love requires freedom. Love, in order to be love, at least as the Bible understands it, must be freely given and freely received. That means that a God who grants creatures the ability to love and be loved cannot at the same time determine that they always do what he wants them to do. Not because God lacks any power, but because it would be a contradiction for God to determine someone to freely do something, right? Because determine and freely would be a contradiction. Now, that means if God is going to grant that kind of freedom, that there are going to be things that happen that God doesn't want to happen. And the simplest way to describe this is God does not always get what he wants. In fact, if you look through the story of scripture, you have God lamenting over and over again. Just read Psalm 81, 11 through 14 as one example, where God is talking about how often he wanted to call them, how he would rescue them in a moment, but they would not turn to him, right? Now, either God is being really disingenuous in those instances, the same when, when Jesus is lamenting over Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I wanted to gather you under my, uh, under my wings, right? Uh, He's either being really disingenuous or actually humans are doing many things God doesn't want them to do because they have some real agency, some real power. But in the Bible, it goes beyond just human agency that morally restricts God from bringing about, at least temporarily bringing about the outcome he wants, because there's not just human agents that have this freedom. There are also celestial agents, including celestial beings that have fallen, demons, and an entire demonic realm that we see a, a glimpse of that in Job. We see it many other places like Daniel 10. You see it throughout Jesus' ministry. You can't read very far in the book of Matthew without encountering Jesus, encountering demons, and the temptation from Matthew 4 and beyond. Uh, I won't go into all of those details of the cosmic conflict here, but there's so much more to the story where God tempor temporarily is not bringing about the outcomes that he wants to bring about. At the same time, what God is doing all the time is not always easily seen. What God has done and is doing is making a way to once and for all defeat evil so that it will never arise again. And the primary focal point of God's solution to evil is Jesus and the work of atonement. And when we have questions about whether God is doing everything that he could do or whether God is just and loving, we should look at Jesus and look at the God of the cross. Because anyone who would come and become human and die for us who didn't have to must be more loving than I can imagine. A God like that can be trusted. And this is, in fact, what is laid out in something uh, in Isaiah, Isaiah 5. Where you have this story where Isaiah tells this, this parable of the vineyard owner. And to, to make a long story short, he says, let me tell you a song of my well-beloved. My well-beloved had a, a vineyard on a hill on this fertile place, and he, he prepared it in every way that he could. He uh, dug a wine van in it. He removed all the stones. He set up a watchtower, right? And he expected it to produce good grapes. But what did it produce? It produced bad grapes, literally stink fruit there in Isaiah 5, right? And then that's, a, that's language of God, the landowner, and the vineyard, his people, or more broadly, the world. And then it shifts in Isaiah where God himself says, now judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there for me to do in my vineyard that I have not done? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones or stink fruit, right? So two things there, judge between me and my vineyard and what more could I do? That's the question ringing in your ears. Well, later in the book of Matthew, I think it's in Matthew 21, if I'm not mistaken, Jesus takes this exact same parable of the vineyard, Isaiah 5, and he expands on it. He quotes from Isaiah 5, if you read that, he quotes from that beginning about this landowner with a vineyard on a fertile hill. And then he says the landowner uh, went away and at the time uh, they, they began to misuse and abuse his property. So he sent to them his servants, right, to call them back. And they beat one and they killed another. And then finally he sent to them his son and they said, oh, this is the heir. Let's kill him and we can take the inheritance. So they took his son and they killed him. Right. And the question that should be ringing in our ears is, what more could he do that he has not done when you actually look at Jesus, the God of the cross? Now, there's much more to the problem of evil 
and the cosmic conflict and free will and all kinds of, uh, of broad parameters that help us to understand why God is not doing everything he wants to do in every instance. But I think the shortest answer is to look at the God of the cross, who is doing everything that could be done in a way that will actually resolve the problem of evil once and for all. There's so much more to say about that, but. Thank you. Thank you for answering that. Before I forget, I want to quickly ask you something. And you touched it when you said the second parable, which is a question that I've been having for a little bit ever since I read that parable, because I compared it to another verse. And it deals with this question before I start explaining a little bit of that. Is God's love hierarchical? Can there be love for uh, one person over another person? And why I ask this is, and I don't remember the exact reference, and maybe you can help me figure it out, but there is a reference where it's where Jesus says, the Father has loved me more because I came and gave my life for you. And to me, that seemed very problematic because I'm just like, first of all, God loves you too. Second of all, second of all, like help me understand what type of God would love you more than me. In my mind, I quickly came to this conclusion. Maybe it's right or wrong. I don't know. But I came to the conclu- conclusion that like, okay, that makes sense. The love of both the God and Jesus is so great. And that is shown because he died for me. So technically that love is equal, right? (laughs) Because of who Jesus died for. But if you could touch on that, like God's love hierarchical and kind of explain that verse, that'd be great. Right. So I think if I'm not mistaken, the verse that you're talking about is John 16, 27, right? Where he talks about the father loves me because I lay down my life for you, right? For this reason, the father loves me, which is parallel to John 14, 21 and, and 14, 23. And just an interesting side note, uh, if you look at those two verses together, those verses together in John 14, 21 and 23, the verb that's used there is agapao, that the, the father loves you and he loves me because I laid down my life for you. Mm-hmm. And then in John 16, 27, the verb is phileo, uh, which already draws, raises some questions about what we've traditionally been taught about agape. We've traditionally been taught that agape is the only unique word for God's love and it's a better kind of love and all the other kinds of love are deficient. But in John 16, 27, the kind of love that God himself has is described as phileo, which tells you already that whatever phileo is, it's not a deficient kind of love because if God has it, it's not deficient. Mm -hmm. But putting that aside for a moment, you have this this broader question of whether God's love is different for some than others. I wouldn't think of it in terms of hierarchical relationships, but there is a stream of content in the Bible, which actually surprised me as well when I was doing my dissertation, when I was trying to allow the Bible to inform these categories and correct things that I had been taught where necessary and correct my own intuitions even because my intuition was similar to to what you just described. But you have this pattern throughout scripture where God talks about, so in the Old Testament, Abraham's described as a friend of God, right? Mm. Well, if everyone is a friend of God in the exact same way that Abraham is, then saying Abraham is a friend of God is to say nothing, right? In the New Testament, uh, we're we're told of the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, what's going on here, right? The Bible also says, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. God loves everyone, but there's something when he says the disciple whom Jesus loved, there's something going on there, right? That is more than that. You have uh, over and over again, you have these, what some have called insider relationships of intimate relationship between God and others coming into friendship with God, coming to be one of the beloved agape toss, which is, it's true that God loves everyone in the broad sense, but then there's this category of those who are called the beloved. Jesus himself is the beloved par excellence, like beloved with a capital B. And anyone who is in Christ by faith is beloved with a small B. They're beloved in the son, right? Wow. And so there's this insider love relationship. But here is what's, where the important part is. Because initially you think, well, that seems strange, right? Mm-hmm. But the, it's not that there is a, a differentiation because God wants it to be that way. God wants to have the most intimate love relationship with every single person, Right. Now, because God is God, he can have intimate love relationship with you and everyone in this conversation and me, and it would be different because we're different people. I don't mean different in terms of value or degree or hierarchy, but different because he loves you as you and he knows you as you better than you know yourself, right? So this kind of love is actually better than the kind of generic love like God shines on you like a sun shines on a rock and it's just kind of equivalent in every way. Now, God loves you as you and he wants to have intimate relationship with you, the most intimate relationship that's possible. And the difference between this broad love that God has for everyone and what, for lack of a better term, we might call insider love is not on God's part. It's on the part of the willingness of the one who's being drawn to God Mm -hmm. continually by God's loving action to actually allow him to actually uh, come into this friendship, intimate relationship, right? And so God wants everyone to be a friend of God and a friend of one another. 
But tragically, some people reject that relational love with God. There's so much more to say about that, but that, that's what's going on in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, where God wants to have this intimate relationship with everyone. And everyone can have that intimate insider love relationship simply by accepting God's love. It's as simple as that. So I wouldn't think of it in hierarchical terms, but it's true that God has different love relationships with different individuals. And the reason why not everyone has an intimate love relationship with God is because some reject that intimate love relationship. Mm -hmm. So horizontal, not vertical. Uh, yeah, you could put it that way. Thank you. Beautiful. There's so many landmines in that topic. So I know that I didn't put it adequately. So I just want to say there's a whole bunch of caveats about that, but that's kind of the gist of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think um, I could take a moment now to market here two of Dr. Beckham's books. Um, the Theodicy of Love will, uh, will give you much more detail about the, uh, the question of the problem of evil that I think Hobby raised to some extent. And the love of God is, well, what the title says, <laughs> it's a book about the love of God, uh, goes a lot into detail into, uh, of the Bible, but also offers different models that are current contemporary. And he, he pits different models against each other and suggests which one is more biblical. And so I highly recommend these books. Now, John, one of the things you mentioned here is the fact that God is um, aff affected by what we do. Um, and that's also been deeply problematic over the course of history. And so I, I guess I wonder if you could touch a little bit on this too. What does it mean for God? What does this imply that what we do affects God? What does that mean for God? Well, in, in the broadest terms, it means that our lives actually matter to God. So now this isn't what people intended to be a consequence of the view that God is just living in kind of unperturbed bliss. But if you think of God as living in unper unperturbed bliss, whatever happens to you, whatever happens in your life, he's just in this, the same state of perfect bliss. Whereas the God of the Bible, when you are in pain, when you're hurting, he is hurting with you. And it's not because he has to hurt with you, right? It's because he has voluntarily identified himself with his creation. And he does this ultimately in the cross, right? And he does this in the most tangible way because Jesus comes and he identifies himself with the downtrodden, trodden, with the disinherited. There's a whole lot to say about that. He doesn't come as a conquering king. They wanted him to come and conquer the Romans, but he actually comes and takes his place with those who are actually being oppressed. But the God of the Bible throughout voluntarily engages in an empathetic relationship with us so that he is suffering with us. And in fact, the God of the Bible suffers most of all because uh so if my son is hurt that hurts me when he broke his arm a few years ago i wish that i could break my arm instead right because i love him because he is my son and god thinks of his children that way and what happens to us actually makes a difference to him and makes a difference to his life on the other hand because he is god all of these sufferings don't overwhelm him, right? He's got, to use a bad metaphor, he's got broad shoulders, right? There's the body language again, but it's just an idiom, okay? He can, he can carry it. So he's not some kind of cosmic basket case, right? If I had to empathize with all the suffering in the world, I mean, even right now, just with social media and just with news media, it can be overwhelming and depressing, not just during a pandemic, but you just see all the suffering in the world. And it's overwhelming, especially if, you, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a sensitive person. But God feels all of this and he identifies with all of this, and yet he can also carry it and he's working to resolve it. And he has the power so that he can promise that in the end, he will resolve it. So that the way Paul puts it in Romans 8, 18, he says, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. Now, Paul is not saying that to trivialize suffering and evil as we experience it now. Paul himself knew suffering, right? He himself gave up his privilege to become a Christ follower, and he was persecuted and beaten and all kinds of things. You read the story of Paul. So he wasn't saying that our sufferings are not so bad after all. Actually, you know, they're not, they're not bad. He's not saying that. Suffering and evil and death is horrible. But what God has in store is exponentially better. And it is promised. And this is the promise of Revelation 21, 3, that in the end, he will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more crying. So what you have with the God of the Bible is you have neither the God who is kind of a passive God who's just a victim, right? Because that kind of God wouldn't be any help to us. So that, that's nice that you cry along with me. But I also want somebody who can help me get out of this mess, who can actually bring an end to the suffering. And the God of the Bible is both and. He suffers with us. And he resolves the problem of evil and the problem of sin in the only way that it could be resolved 
once and for all in a way that is consistent with God's love and his justice and his mercy. And then in the end, he will exercise his power to actually remove all evil once and for all and forevermore. So both are true at the same time. We have a question from YouTube. Um, and the question is, what is the correlation between love and time in the context of God's redemption from suffering? Okay, if I'm getting the question right, what is the relationship between God and time in the context of God's, uh, between love and time yes. in the context of God's redemption from suffering? Well, I'm not sure whether or not I'm understanding exactly what the questioner is, is trying to get at there. But one thing that I could say about that is that the, the God of the Bible actually uh, is depicted as experiencing the flow of time and even looking forward to the day when he will be with us in the intimate relationship that he intended from the beginning. So one of my favorite verses is Zephaniah 317. And Zephaniah 317 uh, uses this imagery that uses just about every single word that the Hebrew language has to describe joy and delight. So one translation, this is the NASB puts it this way. It says, and this is, this is talking about God looking forward to the day when he, will, when he is uh, reunited with the redeemed people, with his redeemed people. It says, in that day, he will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. So you have this imagery of God himself as if he's looking forward to the delight of that day, analogous to the way that a groom is uh, looking with excitement on the bride that is coming. I still remember my wedding day, the first time when Brenda made, made the appearance at the end of the aisle, right? And I'm just, you know, silenced, right? My, my breath is taken away, quiet in his love, and just anticipating that delight, that joy. And the God of the Bible is a God who also is waiting for that day with anticipation, waiting for what the Bible uses as metaphor of this, this wedding day, this wedding feast, that anyone who joins himself to Christ, anyone who accepts Christ is going to partake in and be part of that metaphorical bride that will be united with Christ and united with God forevermore. So that's one way in which love and time relate together. I don't know if that gets at the question that was being asked. Looking at the time. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a question that's in my brain, but I, I don't know if we have time for it. So I'll throw it out there. And if, 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 if it's too big a question to answer tonight, then we can just let everybody mull over it. Um, so not because God is choosing to have more intimate relationships with some people than others, but we see that biblically, it seems that there is that case, you know, and we also, you know, see that the Bible doesn't seem to tend, tend towards universalism where everybody in the end is saved. So, you know, we, we know that there are some people who God loves that ultimately will, 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 will not be saved. And I can just hear voices in my head of people who, who are struggling and they're trying to reconcile the fact that yes, God is gracious and love, but also he has expectations and he has a law and we're supposed to be obedient. And I feel like I can't measure up kind of a thing. And them saying, of course, God loves me, but he'll also love me when he sends me to hell because I don't measure up. And I'm just wondering, like, you, you know, because it's like he loves everybody, but like, I don't measure up. So I'm not in that intimate circle. Like, how can we offer a little bit of hope to anyone who might be feeling that way? Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Thank you for that. So first of all, we need to be very clear that God's love is always unmerited, right? It's never deserved. It's never earned. It is never something that you have to measure up to in order to receive. Right? So this is why I emphasize that the beloved par excellence is Jesus Christ, the righteous, beloved with a capital B. Mm -hmm. And anyone who is in Christ by faith is beloved, is adopted as a child of God through Christ, who is the Son, capital S. We can all be children of God through the Son. And so if you are in Christ by faith, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've come from, you are inside an insider relationship of love with God. And that relationship will only become more and more intimate throughout eternity. And it's mm -hmm. not a matter of comparing oneself to someone else. It's a matter of that journey with somebody who loves you as you more than you could possibly imagine and will never give up on you. And if, if anyone is finally separated from God, it's only because they rejected him 
and rejected the promptings of the spirit over and over and over again until there was no remedy. This is what happens in the Bible, even when judgment events come. God doesn't want to bring judgment. It only comes after there's nothing else that God could do. What more could he do? Second Chronicles 36, 16 says about the destruction of Jerusalem. There was nothing more that he could do. And so many people, when they, when they think about the final destruction or the final end of life of those who finally reject God's love, they think, oh, this seems strange for a God of love. It seems like God is giving people an ultimatum. But this is actually a misunderstanding of what is happening, okay? And part of it is because we, we tend to think of ourselves as beings that just exist, right? We're just here. So if we lose our life, somebody's taking something that belongs to us or that we have in and of ourselves. But biblically, all of creation only exists, only exists in relationship to God. There is nothing that exists that doesn't exist in dependence upon God. So if someone actually chooses finally to cut themselves off from God, that is the same as choosing not to exist, even if they don't realize that's exactly what's happening. Because you can't actually exist apart from God. And if you could exist apart from God, it would be the most miserable existence imaginable, even worse than what people think, uh, some people think hell is that goes on forever. I believe that the Bible teaches that those who finally reject God, they mercifully go out of existence because they have rejected love. And if you reject love, you literally cannot exist. So it's not an ultimatum that God is giving someone. It's analogous to saying, I want uh, I'm a light bulb and I want to shine and have and give off light without a power source, right? It's not going to work. If you cut yourself off from the power, if you cut yourself off from the source of existence, you won't exist anymore. And so only those who are lost are finally lost because they reject love. Mm-hmm. And if you finally cut yourself off from love, the most loving thing that God can do for those who reject him is to actually put them out of their misery, so to speak. And this pains God, it grieves God, but this is why the freedom necessary for love is so important to understand. If, freely must, if, if love must be freely given and freely received, even God can't force someone to love him or love others or to accept love. And if God were to force people to live in heaven or later on in the new earth, but they've rejected love per impossible, They would be utterly miserable, Hmm. right? And so it is a mystery why anyone finally chooses to reject love. But for those who finally make that choice, there is nothing that God can do. He cannot preserve them in existence apart from himself. At best, he could make it appear like he's not with them, which would would be literally to give them a living hell for eternity because they would be miserable. Because the only true joy, the only true fulfillment is actually found in God, the creator. And all the sources of joy, all the sources of fulfillment that we find in this life that we may not, we may not realize actually find their origin in God himself. There's much more to say about that. Uh, but the hope is that God wants you to live with him forever more than you could possibly imagine. And he loves you more than you could imagine. And he is more good and more loving than you could possibly imagine. And when Christians talk about the law of God, the law itself is a law of love that is intended for the flourishing of all creation. It's not an arbitrary thing out there. It's actually meant for your good, for everyone to flourish in harmony with one another. And I could go on and on explaining how those pieces fit together. But the bottom line is God wants to save everyone and he does everything he can for every single individual to live with him and with one another forever. And in the end, we will all see that there was nothing more that he could do than what he has done. Um, I would say if John, if you're okay with that, we could take maybe a few more minutes for one or two quick questions. Sure. And then we'll just transition to conclusion. Um, so I noticed another question on YouTube. I don't know if you can touch on that, but um, uh, it asks uh, from Ephraim, it asks, what can you share about the Odyssey of protest? Um, and I just want to run this, uh, this real quick by everyone else. Do you have any other questions? So maybe he knows what time he has. I have one question. Okay. Um, 
should I say it? <laughs> sure. Yeah, okay. So my, my question kind of goes with what you were saying, and that is um, something that I personally have struggled with is how do you reconcile people who are producing the fruit um, while denying the existence of or denying a relationship with God? So people who experience joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, you know, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit that you receive from God, or even just people who live, you know, um, satisfying lives where they're good people they're compassionate but they adamantly deny that they want to have anything to do with god i think yeah i'm curious yeah so sometimes theologians talk about this in 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 the context of the common grace of god right and so if the biblical the biblical uh meta narrative so to speak is true which i believe it is that god is the creator and everything else depends on him all of those joys that people take in mundane everyday things are actually designed and supported and flow from God himself, even if they don't know it. And so God actually sustains them and sustains the world in a way that they can actually enjoy and partake of the bounties and the wonders of the world that he gave them, even as they are temporarily rejecting him. And all the time, God is drawing them into relationship. And even there, they might not actually be intentionally rejecting him. The God that they're rejecting might not be the God who is, right? It might be a God who is a caricature of God. Uh, They might reject God with a capital G, which is actually uh, a a tyrant or the God who isn't the God of the Bible. And so the God they're rejecting might not actually correspond to God as he is. And because God is the righteous judge, God looks on the heart, whereas we look on the outward appearance. So we can't too quickly judge people that appear to be farther away or closer. Uh, But God is working with everyone and Uh, He loves everyone, even the way Matthew 5 says, uh, he loves even those who reject him and calls us to love our enemies, so to speak. Would you say, is there any convincing reason why somebody who feels like they're experiencing the fullness of life without God, and they don't really care about an afterlife, would you say that there's any reason why they should be living a life with God? Yes, I think actually, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to judge anyone's experience or how they're perceiving their experience to be because I can't get inside their mind. Uh, But what, what I would say is I firmly believe that the most fulfilling life that is possible is only a life with God. And I think that anyone who is truly seeking goodness and love and joy and actually willing to accept love. I think that will eventually, if followed through, not, not necessarily what the world calls love, but love as it truly is, will actually lead them, lead them to the living God of the Bible. So for all I know, some people that think on those terms, I don't, I don't know where they came from. There are a lot of people who, who reject a person they call God for whatever reason. But as I said before, they may not be rejecting the living God. They're rejecting a picture of God. Some people, uh, and I don't want to project this on anyone as if this is the only reason someone would be in that situation. I don't mean that at all. But there are many people who have had bad experiences with their parents. And when they think of God as a father, they think he must be like, like their father, right? Or, or they have bad experiences with Christian churches or other religions. And they reject God because of the way he has been misused against them or the way he has been portrayed. Or they can't think of how there could be a God who exists and yet there's all this evil and suffering in the world. But the good news is that God knows their heart and he knows all of what they've been through. And he takes that into account when he looks on them and when he sees them in ways that we couldn't possibly see. And so I would say that inevitably the the greatest fulfillment that anyone could find would be in union with God. And God in his mercy is drawing all of us closer and closer to him to the extent that we are willing. And so people that are on that path now, they might find that it ends up in an unexpected place. And I think that those of us who call ourselves Christians, we should not be afraid to affirm the the life with God, uh, as we know the living God of the Bible, as as a life of abundant joy and also griefs and sorrows and even anxieties as well, right? Because in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So it's not as if it's all roses, but it is a, a, a life that brings a peace that passes understanding. But at the same time, we shouldn't look at the experience of others and think that we can judge them or where they are, because we are told very clearly by the New Testament, by Paul, to not judge anyone before the time. Everything will be brought to light later on. And so where people are now is, may not be where they end up. And our job 
so to speak, if we're actually going to be friends of the bridegroom, like Isaiah describes himself in Isaiah 5, is to try to reflect the love of God in a way that attracts others to want to know him better uh, and refrain from kind of looking at others and, and, and saying, well, judging them or saying their experience is, is deficient in ways where maybe our experience is deficient in ways we don't understand. And then uh, the other question was, can, what, uh, what can you share about the theodicy of protest? Yeah, so a theodicy of protest is one of the approaches to theodicy that basically is a response to evil that protests evil. And the way some people use this, it actually protests God because they say if there's evil in the world, God must be in some way culpable for it. So I resonate with a protest theodicy in the sense of protesting evil and saying that evil is so horrible that we must be very careful in the way we speak about it so as not to trivialize it or downplay it or try to explain it away. And we should actually be angry in a righteous way about the evil in the world. I think the mistake that some protest theodicies make is that the blame they assign and the anger is misplaced because their anger is against God instead of against the evil. But there again, circling back to the other question, I think God also knows when their anger is misplaced and God in his infinite wisdom and love and mercy, I think even, uh, can look um, favorably upon that because they're angry at him because they think that he is culpable for what he is also angry about. So I think God shares their anger at evil and their anger at grief. And if they could see what he sees and know what he knows, and someday all of, all of it will be open and we will all see it, uh, we would all be angry at the same things and we would all be uh, thankful and grateful uh, for the same one. Uh, but a theodicy of protest is protesting evil and, and in many cases protesting God and saying God must not have any reason. And some who follow protest the Odyssey say any attempt, even attempt to explain how God could be good in light of evil is inevitably going to be harmful because it's going to downplay evil in some way. And I, I think they're right to be uh, worried about that being the case because there are many approaches to evil in the Odyssey that end up doing that. Uh, I won't mention any here because I don't have time to, to be fair to them, but I do think there are many approaches that end up doing that wittingly or unwittingly. And I think if our answer to evil requires us to say something like, well, evil's not so bad after all, or it's really better this way, or, or these kinds of kinds of pat answers, I think we are kind of, of running into the danger of what a, a protest the Odyssey is, is protesting against and arguing against. Uh, but I think we should be angry at evil. I think we should never downplay or trivialize the real suffering in the world, which is, which is, is worse than we know. Um, but I do not think that God is to blame. In fact, I think that God is actually the greatest victim of evil in the world. Mm -hmm. oh. All right. Um, what are your takeaways from tonight, from this discussion? What is your, under your better understanding of God as love and of the concept of, law of love as it relates to uh, emotions? So my takeaway is that... Um, I have always be I have always been really cautious about sharing God and like sharing life with God to my other friends who like Ruth had said that who are living a really fruitful life and a conscious guided life. It's just because that I was afraid to introduce a form of my God and like their life might be ruined because of my introduction. But then I noticed that it's a really short understanding of myself about who God is. And how God can, like, I limited my God. So if I share my God to them, God will have their own intimate relationship to each individual with their correspondence of emotion. And, like, God is limitless. So I should not be afraid of, like, sharing. Oh, there is a God that I know. Do you want to know about it? Because God is, God is more than what I, what I know. That's my takeaway. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think my takeaway best based on what we were talking about, how um, God is changeable, how he is not immutable, right, is that the relationship that we can have individually with him, it's a discovery process. And I think I can feel at peace knowing that in this discovery process, there might be moments of doubt, but that doesn't necessarily mean that my faith has to diminish or increase because of change. 
um, and actually can be very stable for what I know God to be in the past and in the present based on scripture. And I think that this whole concept of of how God's love and even in, in, sh- in, in his anger, it's still a fragment of that love just in a different context. Um, so that's my takeaway. I think going off of that, um, my, my takeaway from this is that God, it's so important that God is angry um, and that his anger is a response in his love to sin. Um, I think that expanded my image of God. And I just see like that God and also kind of what Nicholas was saying that like God's anger is a safe place to be, you know, for the innocent, you know, Um, and also the idea that God, um, like you were saying, is the greatest victim of of evil and of sin and and that he is angry for us because he doesn't, he never wanted us to have to live through this. So yeah, I think I really like that image of kind of a God who's angry at the un- the unfairness, the injustice of evil. Well, I mean, my, my thought jumps off of the anger idea too, because one thing that that when, when Ruth asked that question about God's anger, one thing that that you brought out was Jesus was angry at the people who were self righteous and 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 you know, taking advantage of other people and, and, and standing there and and thinking that they had it all figured out and they were great. And they were, you know, basically like guaranteed, got my heaven card all checked. I'm set to go. That was when he would be angry with people. Um, and so kind of for me taking it to today is like, if there's anybody who's struggling right now, if there's anybody who's just like really feeling like they can't, they can't measure up, they keep messing up and they're wondering, is God angry with me? Is God done with me? Um, is, you know, am, like they might be even be freaking out. Like, am I rejecting God? Am I, am I walking down that path? Am I rejecting the promptings of the spirit? And that, you know, if there's anybody that's agonizing over this, Jesus posture was always one of, he didn't even care if his reputation got tanked for hanging out with you and being your friend and loving you. And his, he never had a posture of anger towards the people who were struggling. And, and that for me is, is a beautiful thing about his anger. Yes, he's angry. He's angry at sin, but he's not angry at people who are struggling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think um, if I could add one thing to all of this is that for me, the fact that God is relational is one of the most important things. Mm-hmm. I love serving a God who is relational and relationship means feelings as well as many other things, right? So God feels mm-hmm. with me. He feels my sorrow and my joy. And I don't think I could believe in a God who doesn't, who is not like that. So I think this conversation is extremely important just in that personal aspect of how do we relate to God? How do we understand God to be? And then how do we respond to that? Knowing that he feels everything with us. Um, and so I, I love that that personal dimension that this conversation brings to the, to the forefront. And um, John, I can only say a big thank you. (laughs) I can only say a big thank you for your time and for everything you brought to the surface in the discussion. Thank you so much for listening to all the questions and engaging with them. I think uh, both the discussion group and our viewers will take a lot from this and definitely ponder some more after, obviously, because there's a lot of material. Uh, But I really appreciate uh, the depth of thought that you bring to this, your expertise, the time that you've spent studying this topic. Uh, and thank you so much for for really taking the time for us in your very busy schedule. We well, really thank you. It's my that. pleasure. And just just for the record, wonderful questions. Really enjoyed the discussion, and all of my answers barely scratch the surface surface of even beginning to answer them. But hopefully, some of the thoughts were helpful. And there is a lot of biblical material behind some of the things I was trying to trying to share in a surely inadequate way. But mm-hmm. but I enjoyed yeah. the discussion. So thank you. Yep, for sure. Which is why you need to buy at least these two books and the, the I, others I that written and continues to be writing and publishing. Um, uh, just to, to introduce the next guest for, what's today, Tuesday, for Thursday, Thursday, March 4, we have an episode on uh, family. We're going to focus on how we can reflect God's love in family context. And our two guests, we have two guests this time, a family, a couple, are Nicole and Ellen Parker, Uh, Nicole is an author, speaker, and adjunct professor in the School of Religion at Southern Adventist University. And Alan, her husband, is a professor also of religion in the School of Religion at Southern. 
And so they will be joining our discussion and we'll focus on the, the concept of, God, of, of love and uh, the love of God as it can be reflected in the family. And so I definitely encourage you to join us then, uh, trying to move into the applicatory segment of our, of our journey, right, of our season and see how, how we can really live out everything that we're learning in this program. Um, and so for the last few, um, few minutes of this discussion, John, I'm, I'm uh, giving the mic back to you. What would you say to our viewers about um, the love of God? Well, there's so much I could, I could say, but I think the one thing I want to emphasize is what, what you were mentioning just a moment ago, Adelina, that, that the God of the Bible is a relational God. He is a covenantal God. He's a God who enters into relationship with creation. He makes covenant, he keeps covenant, he makes promises, and he always keeps his promises. And so you can trust him, you can rely on him, he will never let you down, and his promises are sure. And if if one is struggling or feeling far from God, he is not far from you. And he is working even now to draw you closer to himself. And if you give yourself to him, he receives you just as you are right now. And so one of the promises I think even uh, in the times we're living in right now that I take great comfort in is the promise that, that Jesus gives in Matthew 11, uh, 28 through 30, where he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so love relationship with God, it's relational. It is a back and forth relationship that God invites you into, but it's not symmetrical. God is the one who carries the yoke for you. Some biblical scholars have pointed to this metaphor and said the metaphor, the way they would train a young ox is they would yoke the young ox up with a strong, experienced ox. And when the young ox doesn't know what to do, would try to go the wrong way. Well, the stronger ox is like carrying them, right? Carrying the yoke and taking them the right way and keeping them on the path. This is at least what some have described as the imagery that's being used here in Matthew 11, where Jesus says, yoke up with me, right? And my yoke is easy and my burden is light because I will carry you because you will find rest with me. And I think this is just one of the images of God's love and care for us, which is just demonstrated all throughout the Bible that this is who God is. He doesn't just promise and say, this is who I am. But if you actually take the time to look through all the stories of what God has done and what he does all the way to the cross, the God of the Bible consistently follows through on his promises to carry us and never leave us nor forsake us. And his love is greater and exceeds all imaginable bounds. It goes beyond all reasonable expectations. It is unfathomable and mm -hmm. limitless, and you can find rest in him even right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Javi. Thank you, Kiyun. Thank you, Ruth. And thank you, Nicola. Also, thank you so much for your comments uh, to those of us who have been watching live and interacting with us. We really appreciate them. Um, thank you for your time. It was extremely well spent and I know it's going to continue to be a blessing after the discussion. Uh, I hope you have a blessed week and I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.